653 will be the song of encouragement this morning after the lesson. You know, over the past 30 years, it has been hard not to notice the lack of zeal in the primary work of being a Christian in the lives of many Christians we have known, which is to carry the gospel to a lost and dying world. There are many reasons that may attribute to such an attitude as this, like that of simply not knowing that this is our work in the kingdom because we've not been properly taught. Oftentimes we find ourselves in such situations out in the world where we secure a position with some company and never really get what is often referred to as a job description. A written document outlining exactly what is expected of us in that particular position of work for that company. If we are fortunate in such positions in life, we are at least given a mentor, someone who has been assigned to show us what we are expected to do to earn our pay. But sometimes we are just left to learn the job as we go along, only to find out later that more was expected of us than maybe we had ever been given the opportunity to do. Even as a Christian, when one obeys the gospel of Christ many times, those individuals may go through life just simply assembling together for worship, all the while thinking this is all that God expects of them. And such is certainly not so. In John chapter 4, verses 31 through 38, Jesus tells his disciples exactly what is expected of them and us in this world in a very unique way. Notice this in these verses. Starting at verse 31 in John chapter 4, this is what we read. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples to one another, Hath any man brought him out to eat? Jesus, Jesus saith to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are already white with harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth, and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. In these verses, Jesus said in verse 34, My meat is to the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. John 4, 34. In regard to this work left to finish, the scholarly Adam Barnes makes this comment. It means to complete or to fully do the work which he has commanded in regard to the salvation of men. It is his work, Jesus' work, to provide salvation and his to redeem and his to apply the salvation of the heart. Jesus came to do it by teaching, by his example and by his death as an expiation for sin. And he shows us that we should be diligent. If he was so diligent for our welfare, if he bore fatigue and want to benefit us, then we should be diligent also in regard to our own salvation and also in seeking the salvation of others. Some of you may have written as a have written as a heading in your own Bibles the words Jesus begins his ministry just above Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. I know that this was so in my Bible software that I use when I study. Starting at verse 14 of Luke chapter 4, this is supposedly when they say Jesus started his earthly ministry. It says there at verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, 
And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The verses that Jesus is reported as reading on this occasion in his hometown of Nazareth and the synagogue on the Sabbath day is taken from Isaiah chapter 61, which reads this way, starting at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame you shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I the Lord love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments. And as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bring forth her bud. And as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth. So the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Of course, all the work, or all work, especially that of farm work, work in a vineyard, must begin with priorities. And since this was the work said to be in progress, one to be finished in the verses that we have read earlier, Jesus had to start his work on this earth somewhere, doing something. Naturally, if you were hired in as a shepherd of sheep and you drove up to the farm the first morning and saw even one sheep out in the pasture, instead of it being safely in the fold, you would immediately go gather in that one sheep. But when Jesus got to work on this earth in the first century, he had a whole race of sheep that had gone astray. 
And we read about this in Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 6. Just who caused these sheep to go astray? There in Jeremiah 50 verse 6 it says, My people hath been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountain. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. As we know from our own studies of the Old Testament, the shepherds being referred to here in these verses that lead the children of Israel or led the children of Israel astray were their respective leaders that led them in the ways that mere men often lead, which is contrary to the will of God. Much like what we have begun seeing once again starting this past week in our own country with our own new so-called leadership. With such leaders as this, it is no wonder that sheep go astray. And so Jesus' first work in his earthly ministry was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we read about this in Matthew chapter 15 verses 22 through 28. Where it says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And so as part of that work of gathering back in the lost sheep of the children of Israel, Jesus would employ the services of a few chosen people who were Israelites themselves to assist in this work. Part of this work consisted of what has been called the Limited Commission, which was the sending out of the twelve apostles to only those of the lost sheep of the house of Israel that we read about in Matthew 10, verses 5 through 7. There we read, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritan enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You may have just noticed the importance of gathering in the lost sheep of Israel at this particular time had to do with one fact, that these twelve trusted men were to go about preaching. That being, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why would such news be of such importance to the Jews? Some speak today as the kingdom of Israel as having always existed and that which is to always be. However, the kingdom of Israel had changed hands over the years, had it not, as we recall the words of one such occasion by the mouth of the prophet Samuel to King Saul. In Samuel chapter 13, starting at verse 13, we read, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over the people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. We know that this neighbor was King David. But even though this neighbor was better than his predecessor, King Saul, predecessor King Saul, 
it would be after the death of King David's son Solomon that the kingdom of Israel would yet be divided into two kingdoms. A southern kingdom called Judah, consisting of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and the northern kingdom called Israel, consisting of the remaining ten tribes. The Israelites found their northern kingdom virtually destroyed by the Assyrians by the year 722 B.C. But it would be the Babylonians that finished it off around 200 years later in 586 B.C. to usher in the period of what is called biblical silence thereabout that most scholars say began around 420 B.C. until the time John the Baptist and our Savior came into the world of man. But for what? What did Jesus and John come into the world of man to do? Well, in the book of Daniel, we know that during the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, Daniel was given the ability to interpret a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar concerning several kingdoms that would play a part in their current situation, as well as the kingdom that Christ and his apostles were preaching as being close at hand. Starting at verse 42 of Daniel chapter 2, this is what we read concerning a great image described in the earlier part of this chapter that Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream. Thou, O king, sawest and beholdest a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Now when we read a bit further in the text, we see where Daniel explains to the king just what this great image stood for and what that would mean for him and his earthly kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar. However, we are primarily interested in the last of these four kingdoms that's going to be talked about since that is the one that Jesus and John is preaching about being close at hand in their earthly ministries. But starting at verse 42 of Daniel chapter 2, this is what Daniel said concerning that particular kingdom that would, and what would take place during it. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, thou shalt mingle themselves together with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Now without going into great detail, most scholars agree that the head of gold on this great image represents the Babylonian Empire that was then in progress when... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream was being interpreted. This, according, according to scholars, ran from about 625 B.C. to 539 B.C. The breast and arms of silver represent the Medo-Persian Empire that lasted from 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. The belly and thighs of brass represented the Greek Empire, which ran from 331 B.C. to 63 B.C. And the legs of iron and his feet, part of iron and part of clay, represented the Roman Empire, being the world power at the time of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry when he preached that yet another kingdom of heaven was at hand. Matthew 10, verse 7. It is important for us to realize that this particular kingdom is not the kingdom that Jesus and John spoke of in their preaching. This kingdom that is being described here as being the legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay, but yet it is the Roman kingdom during which another kingdom is going to be established. 
Because it says in verse 44, and in the days of these kings, the kings of the Roman Empire, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This kingdom, of course, is the Lord's one true church, the church of Christ. It is the kingdom that the other prophets would speak about as having its start in Mount Zion, the city of Jerusalem. We read about this in Micah chapter 4, starting at verse 6, where it says, In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that cast far off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, which is a phrase some of us may recall, and I'll mention something more about that in a second. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. This phrase, O tower of the flock, is a clear reference to the birth of Christ by Mary in the what is, was known as the Migdal Eater, the birthing tower of all the lambs born in Jerusalem, and of which Brother Mark McCorder writes this, There were several watchtowers in these fields. All lambs' births occurred in one tower, the Migdal Eater. This tower was on the outskirts of Bethlehem, each lamb was immediately wrapped in swaddling clothes for the first hour or so after birth. The lamb was put in a manger for that time period to help it settle down from the birth. Then the lamb and its mother were taken back to the fields. All of the sheep were kept outside except in cold winter months. This is why we know Jesus was not born in December. We are told the shepherds were in the fields at the time Jesus was born. And so the tower of the flock that is mentioned in the verses just read to you is where they suspect, strongly suspect, that Jesus was in fact born in Bethlehem. However, the prophet Joel would also speak of this coming kingdom as occurring in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. And it was in his prophecy that the apostle Peter quotes as taking place in the city of Jerusalem that we read about in Acts chapter 2, and a subject that we have studied in detail not too many weeks back. But we need to mention this once again for the sake of the importance of the lesson this morning. We read about this in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 40, or through 32 rather. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord came. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion... In Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. This was the beginning of that kingdom that John and Jesus preached as being close at hand. This is the reason why the prophecy of Joel is mentioned in the preaching on the day of Pentecost. This is also the reason why Christ told Peter and the other apostles that were there on that occasion and preaching on the day of Pentecost that they would in fact be given the keys to unlock Christ's church that was to come in existence on the day of Pentecost as the apostles tarried in Jerusalem for the coming of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because the kingdom would come with power we learn from Mark 9, 1. 
But the power would come in the form of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We learn from Luke 24, 49. And that occurred in Acts chapter 1 and is thusly explained as being such in Acts chapter 2. And that is why Peter quoted from the prophecy of Joel chapter 2 on that occasion. But what does all this have to do with our work as Christians in the kingdom today? Well, that question can be answered in the reading of the instructions of Jesus Christ to the eleven after his death, burial, and resurrection. Because in Mark chapter 16 verse 14 we read these words. Afterward he appeared unto unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not that which had seen him after he had risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and, believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Whereas we have already seen the limited commission was carrying the message of a coming kingdom to the lost sheep of Israel. They were telling the lost sheep of Israel, hey, this kingdom is at hand. It's getting near. What we have just read, known as the Great Commission, is the carrying of the message of a kingdom in existence. Hey, this kingdom is now here. It was at hand it happened, it started here in, on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem as prophesied, and now they are to carry it out into the world. That's the Great Commission. This began on the day of Pentecost, speaking again to the lost children of Israel and telling them that the kingdom was at hand but now has come, and those who believed that message were added to the kingdom that day according to Acts 2.47. However, they did not just simply sit around and do nothing after they had obeyed the gospel themselves. They went out and taught other people because that is our job description as Christians. We are to go out and teach others what we ourselves have learned and obeyed. We have immediate evidence that they began doing the work of the kingdom by preaching and teaching others what they themselves had learned. Simply read the book of Acts. However, we cannot seem to get most new converts involved in such work today, can we, brethren? We may have been thinking that this is a problem just here in North Alabama, but... I have Facebook friends in Texas who are experiencing the same issues with congregations of the Lord's Church there. In fact, just during this, these last couple of days, I've been answering a brother in Christ who seems to have an attitude that may very well be the cause of people not wanting to get out and evangelize like they should. A question was asked on our Facebook group, I have been reading atheist comments online and they say things that God commanded genocide, infanticide in the Old Testament. They usually cite the flood, the killing of the Canaanites, the killing of families, infants, etc., etc. in 1 Samuel 15.3 as well as verses such as 2 Kings 8.12, Isaiah 13.16, Hosea 13.16, Psalm 137 verse 9, etc. to support their views. How would we refute these claims of an atheist? Well, this particular question is a very good question, and one which many of us may be facing in the near future if we haven't faced it already, being that we have just had an election stolen from our former president here in the United States, 
who was attempting to bring a sense of morality back into our government. Anyone who would dare cheat and steal something as precious as the election of being president of our country could never hope to be trusted as bringing any semblance of hope and morality and justice into the world. You cannot begin to do something like that after having stolen an election. This man cannot be trusted. Such things as this man has been doing over the first few days in office should tell us all that this is so and cause each of us to wonder indeed about the damage that can be done to our great country concerning moral issues that are being legislated now on as law and the carrying of the gospel into a lost and dying world. But what is even more amazing to me is how another brother in Christ saw fit to answer this good Bible question I just read to you about those who are atheists in the world and how best to answer their arguments. And this is what another Christian said in reply to this. Proverbs 26.4 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like him. All atheists are fools, Psalm 53.1. You can't teach a fool anything. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1.7, don't waste your time in trying to answer these people. Well, my first reply to this brother was giving him the benefit of the doubt that he did not really mean what he had just said. That it would be a waste of time in trying to answer an atheist. I did this by saying the following. I agree with the remarks made by Brother Hatcher, and I have the war and flu debate in book and MP3 for anyone who might be interested. I must take issue with the reply by this brother, who I will not name, for I'm quite sure he does not mean that atheists and agnostics are not worth our evangelistic efforts, although such may be construed from his statement. Proverbs 26.4 does not say, Answer not a fool at all. It says, answer not a fool according to his folly. Meaning we would not want to use foolish reasoning in our own answers to an atheist arguments of these kind. These arguments are indeed answerable. In fact, I've been listening to this particular debate just over the past few weeks. And though Dr. Flew did a most terrible work defending the atheistic view, at least Brother Warren made those arguments and basically debated himself. However, my reply did not seem to convince my brother. He came back and doubled down on what he was arguing, that atheists are basically fools and we shouldn't waste our time trying to preach the gospel to aliens, uh, atheists. He said, Jesus himself said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you, Matthew 7, 6. The late Wayne Jackson in his New Testament commentary noted of this verse, When such clearly are identified, the wise person will direct his attention elsewhere, lest he become entangled in harmful controversy. Page 13. There's no reason for you or anyone else to have a problem with what I wrote. The original question had to deal with those who were attempting to set our arguments to answer atheists. They are not conversion material. Can you believe that? They are not conversion material. If anyone claims to be an atheist, you're just wasting your time. Can you believe that a Christian would actually say something like that? They are not conversion material. They are fools and should be recognized as such. To that I replied, no one disagrees that there is a time and place when such becomes necessary. But God does not teach nor encourage Christians to not make an effort to teach anyone, even an atheist. The atheist has a soul and they deserve an equal opportunity to hear and obey the gospel. Surely you would not disagree. But surely he did. When another tr brother tried to help him out with explaining what he thought he meant, he brought up the fact that we shouldn't waste our time with people who are atheists when there are people who may be more receptive, like people in prison, who might obey the gospel quicker. 
I said one might argue that even those in prison are more receptive but for false purposes since life is made easier on those in prison and outside if they appear to have changed their life. Christians are to sow the seed in water and God gives the increase. We do not make personal judgments based upon the appearance of anyone's preconceived mindset. Such is a very dangerous mindset to have in a lost and dying world. I've been part of congregations with such a mindset who would not darken the door of the homes around their meeting house or their neighbors. And they said they know where the church building is. I shudder to think about the future of the Lord's church in the coming years with the progression of an atheistic society and government, governmental legislation of morality. Matthew 7, 6 has often been taken out of context to teach this when in fact Jesus' first and foremost mission during his earthly ministry was to the lost sheep of Israel. And Jesus could have been stressing that very importance as he himself did use the same word dog in Matthew 15, 25 through 28. I then go on to quote Brother Guy in Woods and some others who completely disagree with what this brother said and what Brother Wayne Jackson said concerning casting pearls before swine. That does not necessarily have anything to do with how much time we spend teaching someone the gospel. And even if it did, it doesn't say that we completely bypass some. It gives the impression that whatever we do in a sense like that, we do it and then there comes a time when we may be wasting our time. But we don't completely not do it at all. But Guy in Woods and others says that this simply means that we shouldn't take things that are meant to be righteous things and go out and encourage people doing wrong things. Like we could, couldn't take money or shouldn't take money from the church treasury to go out and give to an alcoholic who's going to use that money to drink with. That is what others say. These are simply comments made by people. There are not principles found within this that some people are not worthy of evangelizing. We're fixing to sing a song just in a few moments. It's our invitation song called The Gospel is for All. Please notice as we sing this song right here that the song doesn't go The blessed gospel is for all except atheists. The gospel is for all except atheists. The gospel is for all. It doesn't make any difference if a person is an atheist, if a person is an agnostic. It doesn't make any difference what a person believes. We are supposed to go out and sow the seed and water it. God will give the increase. We're not responsible for the condition of the soul. That is people's hearts. Yes, some of that soil is going to be rougher than others. But I'm not responsible for going out there and doing soil tests. I'm responsible for going out there and sowing a seed. And I'm responsible for going out there and watering that seed afterwards. I leave the soil test up to the person who owns the soil. And I leave the increase up to God. I don't doubt His Word the seed as being capable of growing in any kind of soul, even an atheist soul. And it is shameful, really shameful, when I see people like this who believe that some people, like an atheist, are just not worth spending your time on. And that's exactly what he said. I tried to give him a moment and a time to extricate himself. I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, you don't really believe what you just said, do you? I mean, didn't you just phrase that wrong? And the man doubled down and said, no. Could you imagine having a man like this in the congregation with you and you going out knocking doors and saying, well, this man right here is an atheist. Well, let's just pass on by. He's a fool. The Bible says such is a fool. 
It doesn't say you don't carry the gospel to a fool. It may call him a fool for not believing in God, but you have to go out and offer it to him nonetheless. There's nothing in the Bible that says you don't offer the seed to a fool. Some of our brethren just simply do not know how to reason when it comes to the Bible. And if we ever wonder why the church is in the condition that it is today with people just being satisfied with sitting in the pews and not going out into the world and trying to teach the lost and give an answer for the hope that's within us, it's because people have attitudes like this. You know, we know some people in this world right around here close or dead that used to believe that black people did not have souls. Well, would you go out and preach the gospel to somebody who didn't have a soul? Well, that'd be a waste of time, wouldn't it? Going out and preaching the gospel to somebody who didn't have a soul? How many times do you think people might have been responsible for looking at the people that live on this mountain and saying... Where those people are, are fools. They're just dumb and ignorant rural people. There's no use in going out and carrying the gospel to them. They ain't got enough sense to believe it. Do you think such as that may be possible? Do you think such as that may have had something to do with the fact that members of the local churches around here never come up and evangelize the areas in which we live? That we had to wait all these many years to do it ourselves? I have no problems believing that after I've worshipped with some of them and see and hear their attitudes that they have like this regarding lost people. This is our work in the kingdom. Our worship and our work are two separate things. People do not understand that they have a job to do in the church. They only think they're supposed to worship and go home. We are supposed to be at work in the kingdom because the harvest is still white. And it will continue to be white as far as we know. We can't go out here and make a judgment call and say, well, there's no more people willing to obey the gospel. That's out of my call. I hope nobody here thinks that they're able to make it. We might not see very much fruit from our efforts that we put forth here in this community, but we need to keep on putting forth the effort. Even if we don't see fruit from it, from it we need to do it because it's our work to do. What comes from it is not our responsibility. It shouldn't be our concern. Our concern should be doing the work. And it should be the concern of this other brother here and doing the work where he lives. And these other brethren that I talked to in Texas who could not go to a congregation anywhere around there who's willing to go out into the communities and knock doors and try to evangelize. He simply won't go to those congregations. He'll meet with their elders, and if they're not evangelistic, he goes on to another congregation. He won't worship with them. Is that not sad? It's basically why we're here, isn't it? It's because other congregations do not see fit to do the work that we know we're supposed to be about doing. If you have a need to respond to the gospel message this morning, that gospel message to become part of the kingdom that we've talked about this morning begins with hearing the good news. Somebody's got to preach it. Somebody's got to carry it in order for somebody to hear it. When we hear the gospel and become a believer in Jesus Christ, we repent of our sins, confess our faith in Jesus Christ before witnesses, and are baptized for the remission of sins, the Lord adds us to that kingdom that we read about this morning. The kingdom that will destroy all the other ones, and this kingdom will last forever. It's an everlasting kingdom. If you want to become part of that kingdom, obey the gospel this morning. If we can help you do that or assist you in repenting of public sin, we pray that you'd make those sins known only as publicly as they are known. If we can help you in learning more about the work that you're supposed to be doing as a Christian, 
We have books in there that we can give you to help you to know what you're supposed to be doing as a Christian. Or we can sit down with you as a mentor and help you to understand those things. We are not going to leave anyone in the dark as to what they're expected whenever they obey the gospel. We will show you exactly what's expected of you in the kingdom and then leave the work to you and the fruit gathering and the produce, the production of the fruit to God. And once we do that, we can all be pleased with ourselves and understand that we are doing the will of God as best we can. Whatever your needs are this morning, we pray that you'd make your needs known as we sing the invitation song.